Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. I'm welcomed here by uh, Danny Haifong. First time on the show, but I've been I, I really like your work at Black Agenda Report and uh, and your your show. I just start, started to check that out. Um, so uh, and you can see what all of uh, Danny's credits are below. If you're not familiar with his work, please, please, please start following what he's doing because uh, it's it's important now more than ever. Um, you know, I want we talked about, you, you know, the last week or so, like, oh, we got to get you on the show. And, you know, it's like, gee, I wonder what we're going to talk about. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. here we are. Um, so I, I, I don't even know where to begin, but I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'll say this at the top. I'll say this at the top. I, I did not think, and I've done videos on this. I did not think Putin was going to do this. I did not think he was going to um, bomb. And, um, I, I, I really am, I really am shocked that, that, that he did this. And, uh, I, I don't want to see war anywhere. Um, but we have to have a, a broader conversation than the, than the corporate, because according to CNN today, in, in on the, the the front page of the newspaper this morning, just in bold caps, it said invasion. I mean, they're acting like this is 9-11 or Pearl Harbor. They're acting like Putin just sent a hundred thousand troops across the border and and all hell's breaking loose. And I'm gonna show this in a second, but there's a there, there what we're not seeing is that actually Putin has bombed US. NATO military installations and bioweapons and stuff like that. So, and in this crazy era, two things can exist at once. So if I'm critical of the United States involvement in this, oh, I love Putin. I'm, I, I'm a Putin puppet. I love war. I'm sure you've been called whatever else for, for that kind of stuff. Everything. Yeah. Um, so, but, but the, the thing that's driving me insane is one that, that comp, that just like narrative that, you know, Putin has just gone bananas. No mention of the United States backing neo-Nazis in the Ukraine as far back as 2014 under the Obama administration. And no, no mention of this map that we've all seen. I've shown it on my show. I'm sure I'll show it again today. Of all the American bases surrounding Russia. I mean, there's no way on this earth, Danny, if there was a Russian, just one Russian base in Canada or Mexico, we would lose our shit. Like, so I, I, um, as someone who's been covering this, um, how, what do you, what do you make of all this? And, and, and how do you, you know, how do you see this playing out? Well, I was going to bed last night and a lot of this news started to come out about the Russian invasion. And a lot of the news was very cryptic. It was very vague. It was uh, explosions were happening in Kiev. And it was just, it seemed like just minutes after Vladimir Putin announced that Russia was going to aid the uh, Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic <clears throat> at their request because they asked for more aid. and. All of the reactions, similar to the reactions to uh, just a few days ago, where Russia, where Vladimir Putin came out with a statement saying that he was going to send peacekeepers to that region, that was seen by, I mean, a broad spectrum, honestly, of the United States' population, especially even the left, even some people who call themselves the left. Saw that as this term invasion, as you said. There's an invasion happening without any attention to the context that you mentioned, Graham. There, there's even a more specific context that isn't being mentioned, and that is what's happening in eastern Ukraine. Why are these breakaway republics asking for Russian assistance? What has been happening over the last eight years that would cause these breakaway republics, which are majority, vast majority, Russian-speaking, uh, identified uh, as Russian, why would they ask for this help? And it's because there has been a so-called civil war happening there that has been aided, abetted, and backed by the United States. The United States has sent, uh, I think, $650 million worth of military aid alone to the Ukraine. 
all of which has gone to either the Ukrainian military or these so-called paramilitary groups, which several of whom are far-right fascistic groups like the Azov Battalion, which is fighting in eastern Ukraine and is deeply involved in the tens of thousands of people that have been killed or displaced there. UN statistics say that the vast majority of those 80% over this period are non-government controlled areas, people who live in these non-government controlled areas. So that means there is an outright war happening right on Russia's borders. And we've had several months now where the United States has been stoking it. And we can go back to the 2014 coup, of course, because it's so important to provide that context, the United States providing aid to a certain section of this so-called Maidan revolution which inevitably not only overthrew the government, but also helped bring these far-right fascist armed groups into the National Guard. So even though there are a lot of people who will tell me now and who are saying all of my replies and responding to my work saying, oh, well, there aren't far-right fascist groups in parliament anymore, right? Because they were there after the coup, an unelected coup, right? That overthrew a democratically elected government in 2014. And then 2019, they didn't win any seats, supposedly. But the damage had already been done, and they are embedded in the very defense forces of this coup government. So it's neither here nor there, whether they're officially in parliament or not. They are dictating policy. And it's obvious that they're dictating policy because the civil war has not ended, and there is no prospect for it to end, which leads us to the conclusion that a big reason why Russia is doing what it's doing right now is because all of the options, the other options have been exhausted. Russia, over and over and over again, over the past several months, has asked the United States to stop interfering, has requested the demilitarization of the region, has asked the United States to stop pursuing NATO membership for Ukraine, and the United States snubbed Russia each and every time. And so I think the real question here is, what is driving the emotional response to this? Because I think at just the basic level, our position should be on the left. And anyone who considers themselves in favor of peace, it should be the United States doesn't even belong in this region at all. It has no, it should, it has no jurisdiction legally in, under international law over what Ukraine does, over what Russia does over how countries in this region develop and decide to determine their own destinies. None at all. But that's not even in the conversation. The conversation is Russia is invading. Russia is the aggressor. aggressor. Russia is an imperialist country, right? That's the narrative right now. And it's damaging because it's, it has nothing to do with the facts on the ground the context that we need to know, and the situation at hand, which requires us to call for the United States, like in most cases, to end its endless wars. That's what is really at heart here. But it's so easy in this new Cold War environment when Russia responds to years of provocations to say, oh, now Russia is doing the wrong thing. But it's like, put yourself in Russia's shoes. You mentioned some things. You mentioned the huge expansion of NATO along its borders, three countries alone, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, right on Russia's borders. And this Mm -hmm. isn't even to mention that Ukraine shares a long border with Russia and nearly all of the fighting that is going on in Ukraine is right along Russia's border. So Russia is surrounded by... NATO and U.S. weaponry bases and aggressive paramilitary groups backed by the United States. The CIA is literally admitted to training these groups, paramilitary groups in Ukraine, mm-hmm. since 2015, and they're fighting along Russia's border. What would you do if you were Russia? I ask those who are so so judgmental and think that Russia is bringing the world to the brink of World War III. No, that's the United States is doing, and it's mm-hmm. an ongoing process which has been virtually ignored by most people. Well, well that's, that's that, 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 there it is. There's the answer. Everything you've just laid out 
that none of that, I mean, none of that is covered by the corporate media, not none of it. I mean, it's, it's, it's so, so in order for someone, the average American to know what you're talking about, they would have to dig deep, which, which, uh, you know, I mean, this, it, you, you see the whole, when, when a war pops off like this, you really see the long con of the ruling elites and the military industrial complex. So this is like, you have Americans who have to work themselves to the bone. They don't have the time to like dig deep yeah. and find stuff. They've done a great job of fake news and using, you know, QAnon, January 6th to say anything outside of the corporate media is is lies. And they can, they can say, Oh, look at how much Fox news lies. Sure. Fox news lies all the time, but then nobody calls out the lies of CNN and MSNBC and they're doing, or, or when they do, it only comes from Fox. So then it's this perfect, you know, they, they keep the country divided, distracted, and afraid. They do a great job. You got to pick a team. Are you red or you blue, you Fox or you MSNBC. You know what I mean? Pick one, you know, you, are you vaccine or you ivermectin? Like just pick a team and, and, you, you, there's no subtlety. So all of this stuff, I mean, I've even had to like do some digging because I haven't been following Ukraine as much just because I'm just one guy doing a show in his apartment. I can't follow everything, but mm -hmm. all that stuff you're laying out, no one is talking about the eight years that these, these separatist regions who are identified with Russia have been being bombed by the Ukrainian government with help from the United States. No one's talking about that. Everyone just, and this is the standard American war machine propaganda we're just sitting here just you know all barbecuing in our backyards and then crazy putin just comes in and just throws a bomb in our swimming pools and we gotta react and it's just like i mean this keeps happening in america you know just keep drinking this kool-aid and they won't look into any of this and i've 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 posted today too um, on all my social media platforms and I've put, put it on this show. So the defense industry, if you go to opensecrets.org and anybody watching, go here, right, go right now and just put in the search defense industry and then look at 2020. So in 2020 and 2020 campaign, they donated a total of $49 million to Republicans and Democrats. And I think it was like 52, 48 Republican to Democrats. So pretty evenly down the line, 3.1 million dollars to Joe Biden's campaign, 2.7 to, to Trump. They just said, whoever gets in there, we're going to have war. I mean, shit, they gave 800 grand to Bernie Sanders, which was like, broke my heart to, to read. Um, so like people, and this, 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 they know how to prey upon people's emotions and they know how to just go invasion and the ticker. And then they show the like old woman next to the bombed out building. And that preys on your emotions. And I'm not saying that, that Putin's bombs haven't hurt anybody or are good. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of any bombing. I've been to war zones in Iraq and Afghanistan and it's awful. I've seen what it does and you know, who gets hurt the most it's innocence. It's innocent women and children. But then what drives me insane is America and Joe Biden giving that crazy speech today and on, and the media just lock stepping in to like, I'm sorry, I don't know. Yemen has anyone Yemen, the 20 years of bombing America has done in the middle East since Putin got into power right around year 2000, 2000 right? He's been in power about 20 some years, which nine 11. So the global war on terror has been happening for the, basically the totality of Putin's, uh, yeah. uh, in power. Add it up. How many people has Putin bombed and murdered to the America? Add it up, baby, because we are number one, as always. Um, and I just can't sit here and watch America, even if even if everything the American media said about Putin is true. Let's just say for argument's sake, oh, he's this evil dictator. He wants to take over the world. He's ex-KGB. He wants to bring back the Soviet Union. Okay, let's say that's all true. The numbers are the numbers. No one has dropped more bombs than we have in the last 20 years. I mean, look at goddamn Afghanistan. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's maddening to me to, to, to hear this and Americans just swallowed up and then, and then good old neoliberals, you know, if a Democrat's in the white house, man, do they love war? It's okay when a Democrat does war. And it's like, I mean, shit, I could go on and on. I mean, it's just like, and this is the, you know, Joe Biden has the lowest approval rating. He has an approval rating lower than Trump ever had. 
and 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 here we are like it's it's so frustrating um so i guess my my neck my, my question to you and I, and you know this is the frustration of all of us in indie media like how do we get you know we post stuff on social media and we get called kremlin stooges or whatever you know whatever mad whatever crazy things we've all been called we have friends of ours i'm sure you have good smart college educated liberal friends of yours that think you're you know whatever you've helped trump or putin or whatever nonsense like how do we combat this well, I think that there are many ways that we can combat it, but there's a, a definite relationship between, I think, the overall geopolitical and world situation and the limitations, right, that we face in the United States, in the current political situation and state that the United States is in. So given how stagnant things are right now, I mean... I've been thinking about this a lot lately. After the 2020 Bernie Sanders campaign ended in a sputter, you know, ended in disaster, it's quite clear that there's a lot of confusion right now about what exactly does it mean to be a leftist? What does it mean to stand for peace? What does it mean to address these monumental crises like COVID-19, the latest capitalist crisis, these endless wars, right? People are struggling at such an intense degree, as you mentioned. And this is one of the worst periods, I think, for the United States since the Great Depression, since the 2007, 2008 crisis. And then you add a public health calamity on top of that. And it's quite easy for vulnerable people to be taken on wild political rides. And I think that's what a lot of people are on right now and trying to figure out how to understand the crises before them as they deal with their own personal crises, their own experiences and conditions of, of exploitation. And so what we can do, I think, is we can continue to work together and build solidarity among each other and find ways to plug into both organized efforts as well as a broader media campaigns and all sorts of ways to get the message of peace out there and to truly educate people in the United States and the West, because that's really where the big gap is, right? A lot of the world, especially the progressive forces in the world, do not agree with U.S. policy, see the United States as the biggest threat to world peace correctly. However, after, during COVID-19 and over the course of even just say the Obama, Trump, Biden era, there's been a huge political shift to the right. So much so that you have more than two thirds of people in the United States who view Russia and China as the principal threat to their own, you know, to their own security. They view Russia and China so unfavorably that it's quite hard from that perspective to challenge these policies, even though it is the dominant agenda of the dominant foreign policy agenda of the United States. So we need to really unmask what that agenda is because it's so easy. And, and this dates very far back. We it, This is nothing new. The way that Russia has been treated, especially since Russiagate beginning in the Obama era, where it seemed like all of these attempts to make Russia into some kind of vassal state were starting to unravel. So the United States made a geopolitical and national security state strategic decision to say, okay, now Russia is in the great power competition camp. It is in the enemy camp. And the same went for China as China has developed and charted its own course of development. So what we really need to do is start start to unmask this agenda and to do so in a way that's non-discriminatory because what i've noticed a lot is that a lot of the ways in which we talk about this new cold war against russia and china that the united states is waging it often focuses on one or the other it almost reinforces this wedge theory that the united states's military brass have been talking about for a long time how do we pit russia and china against each other and so a lot of the ways we focus on 
U.S. provocations toward Russia and China tend to be separate and tend not to see the global view, the world's view of what exactly is going on. And when we start to peel back this agenda, when we start to ask, well, why is the United States militarizing the Asia Pacific at the degree that it is? Why is it surrounding Russia with all of these military bases? Why is it waging all these proxy wars, Hong Kong, Syria, for example? Mm -hmm. Why is it doing that? And then when we start to unmask the why, which is to contain Russia and China, they say it outright. Foreign Policy Magazine published a hit piece that from a uh, one of the Atlantic Council, NATO's think tank, from one of their fellows, which directly stated that Washington needs to wage war against Russia and China simultaneously. And that's been the policy, right? It's been the policy in a new Cold War sense, right? A, a, a consortium of various policies from sanctions to uh, diplomatic uh, strangulation and provocations to proxy wars within and outside of the borders from the propaganda war, Russia Gate, you know, lab leak to Xinjiang human rights, all of this, right? It's a, it's a consortium of policies that is meant to drive further militarization, to satisfy the war profiteers, and to arrest what is an inevitable development, that the United States' role in the world is going to decline. It already is on the decline. Its dominance is unraveling. It is a much weaker country objectively than it was even just 20 years ago, 22 years ago, 21 years ago, when George W. Bush announced the global war on terror. These last two decades have been marked by imperial decline. The United States cannot get its way in the same form or in the same way that it was in the past. It was able to in the past. And that's because there is a different pole in the world. There are other countries like China and Russia, China and Russia being in the lead of this, but other countries as well across Latin America and Eurasia that are saying, no, we can do things ourselves. We're not going to exclude the United States. If the United States wants to be an equal partner, if it wants to engage in a way that's mutually beneficial, sure. That's been Vladimir Putin's line since 2001 and only since uh, around the last 10 years, has there been a huge shift in how the Russian government is viewed? But nonetheless, the United States sees that as a threat. It sees any independent activity, expression of self-determination as a direct threat, because that means that there's a possibility that these countries will, in economic negotiations, in economic relations, in political relations, they will begin to assert themselves as equals. And that's really what is at the heart of all of this. The United States says, I want to see China grow the way it is and to say, oh, no, we can we can have this policy agenda. And certainly we'll have economic, uh, economic relationship with you, but that relationship is not going to dictate what we do. Russia has been doing something very similar as well, different in form, but similar on that basis. And all of the countries that have allied with Russia and China and have come out even for Russia's support for these breakaway republics, Nicaragua, Cuba, they're thinking the same way. Okay, we'll have relationships with the United States, but the United States is treating us like second-class citizens of the world, sanctioning us, starving us, threatening us with coups and wars. So... We're going to go with countries that respect us and that respect our right to politically and economically determine our destinies. And that's at the heart of this whole issue, this whole ongoing development with Ukraine is how does the United States make the world in its image and how does it keep Ukraine and the whole region because this is a regional war that the United States is waging, keep that whole region within its orbit and underneath its thumb so that it will obey all these governments across the former Soviet republics, Eastern Europe. And we can go beyond that, right? Really anywhere 
where there's a possibility of Russia, even Libya, right? Libya was destroyed, but the United States is still very worried that even Libya's mm -hmm. very chaotic situation, that government, whatever is left of it, will, uh, will have relations of any kind with Russia, right? So it's really all about containment, isolation, and maintaining this hegemony that the mm -hmm. United States is so invested in, because without it, really everything begins to unravel. Now, it's not just the legitimacy anymore. It is the real power that the U.S. has to determine affairs and, and everywhere. To, to add this, I mean, the, 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 every country you just mentioned has gotten off the petrodollar. I mean, China got on the petro yuan. They got rid of the petrodollar. Um, China and Russia said, you know, we're going to we're going to do oil. Let's let's not forget the oil component of this. I mean, this is you talk about American hegemony. It's it's about the petrodollar and exerting its financial clout and it has a massive military to back its basically you know we're just like uh, some sort of loan sharking mob yeah. <laughs> with a massive army behind us is basically what we do and it's so so like every Qaddafi said we're getting off the petrodollar Saddam Hussein we're getting off the petrodollar Syria said i mean all of this is is tied in and there, you know, there's more specifics to each region, but overall, the petrodollar has so much to do with this. Russia and China have pipelines together. Um, Russia wants to do this this Nord pipeline to Germany, and we've come in and said, I just did a video on this like two weeks ago, week and a half ago. We said, well, we don't want you to, we don't want Germany. Uh, you can't get that pipeline because it's cheaper. So we we're going to give you American oil, which will be more expensive. So that's another thing. Like that's one of Russia's cheap chief uh, exports is oil yeah. and well, that's no good because i mean that's what the pipeline through syria is to get to western europe that's like one of the biggest oil markets in the world and that's why we didn't like that pipeline because we wanted saudi oil and and syria said no you can't have that pipeline so we're like oh syria is bad and then that's another country that we've destabilized and all that so it's really like so much of this and then and then the selling of it to the American people is always on these sort of like patriotic heartstrings and freedom and, and like how many innocent civilians have American presidents, including Obama, uh, murdered with their unintended, uh, targets, you know, 90% of our casualties, you know, Obama dropped more bombs than Bush. Bush started an illegal war. And everyone, the the the, the anti-war movement was all in the streets, and that was great. And then Obama came in office and oh, I'm gonna get rid of these wars, and then he just dropped more bombs, and everyone was too busy at brunch to give a damn. And and now all of a sudden, you know, we're just acting like we're just these innocent bystanders, and big bad Putin is, is you know, swinging his 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 his, mili his big gun around and, and terrifying everybody. Um, which is just like it's so. Um, but you bring up such excellent points and basically it is sort of our duty in the indie media to just try to get the, the nuance to this and the stuff that the corporate media isn't talking about, um, out there in the mainstream to get people to sort of, to wake up, um, to this. So, I mean, mm -hmm. huh. Hello, everybody. My name is Graham Elwood. You're watching The Political Vigilante. I'm here with Danny Haifong from Black Agenda Report. Uh, we've been discussing, obviously, what is going on with Russia, uh, the bombing of the U of Ukraine, which I'm not, I, I, I wish was not happening, but we've been talking about all of the reasons America has been intervening or creating this scenario to allow this to happen. And Danny, I want to talk now specifically about because we were just touching on sort of the financial components of, of this and what this is really about. It's about America not, America is a collapsing empire and like all collapsing empires, they 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 try to grab as tight as they can as they're, as they're losing control and they're losing control financially. Um, and they're losing, you know, they're, they're losing their foothold with the world. So what are the things Biden announced today in this crazy speech that's just like, and then starts talking about gas prices. Like, it's just maddening to me that the American media is more concerned with gas prices than the horrific loss of life and the destruction of, of property and families and all this awful shit that comes with war, right? 
I mean, th th there's no discussion of this. It's just like war. We, and, and, and hey, hey, Americans, you're going to have to handle five, six dollars a gallon at the pump to, to defend your freedom. There's a cost for freedom. Well, shut. Like, I, I, I wanted to punch the TV screen when I saw that. So they bring in all these sanctions, which sanctions are an act of warfare. Um, and we sanction all these countries all over the world. I have a I have a documentary called Graham Goes to Russia, which is available exclusively on rockfin.com slash Graham, El, Graham Elwood. And I interviewed people. I just went to Russia because I wanted to see what Russians were like. One of the people I interviewed was this guy who was a, was like basically a cab driver. And he had a job uh, at the cargo port as a logistics manager. Pretty good job. And he lost that due to the sanctions from Obama. And then had to start driving a cab. In typical Russian fashion, I said, are you mad at Obama? He goes, not angry, just fact, you know, which was just like such a great, <laughs> it's like, wow, I'd be mad, but he wasn't. I give him credit for that, right. which that's who these sanctions hurt. We're not hurting Putin. We're hurting some guy that's just got a job. You know, he's got working in a cargo port. Now he's got to drive a cab. Like, like that's, that's who these sanctions hurt. And what, you know, what I what what has happened today? I don't know if you follow crypto or not, but I, I I follow crypto and I follow Bitcoin, and the Bitcoin price has not been doing well lately. And leading up this last week, it's been kind of low because there's fears of this war, fears of this war. When the when the when the bombing happened, I hesitate to use the term invasion because they've just bombed thus far. Um, the price of Bitcoin went down, and then Putin announced that Russia is going to be basically, I don't know to what degree, but starting to use or convert even to Bitcoin to stave off these economic sanctions. And the Bitcoin prices started to pump back up a little bit. So, uh, you know, what El Salvador did last September, well, they announced it in June and then it became official in September, I think has changed things. And I think if you read the Bitcoin white paper that came out in 2009 in, in direct response to the economic, the, you know, the housing crisis of 08, America is facing, uh, we've been, we just printed whatever $9 trillion in the last two years versus all these stimulus plans. We have inflation uh, across the board, some of it manufactured by greedy corporations who've experienced big, yeah. big profits. Um, I know I'm doing sort of a, a large economic setup. How do you see the sanctions and, and Russia's response with Bitcoin? How do you how do you see this playing out? Part of me, the, the optimist in me, and a Bitcoin holder is like, well, maybe Russia will go, ha ha, and and you know this will because if people see Russia becomes you know adopts Bitcoin as its major currency, Bitcoin investors are going to dump into it, and the price is going to go up. I mean, uh, you know, uh, so which was the part of the design of Bitcoin was to get rid of the central banks like the Federal Reserve and the IMF who have a, you know, as we've discussed, mob-like financial control over countries. How do you see this financial and from a financial and a sanctioning standpoint play out? Yeah. I mean, I think, it, I think there's so many levels to it. I mean, you outlined the Bitcoin aspect of this and I think that's really interesting. I don't follow Bitcoin myself, but I do find the fact that the US dollar is so fragile right now, not necessarily on the cusp of collapse because the United States does own the biggest financial institutions or have majority stake and leadership over the financial institutions which really dominate the landscape. But there is this significant shift away from the US dollar that. I think points to the future of where the world is going and sanctions ironically this, they cause an incredible amount of pain so of course these sanctions are going to harm ordinary russians working people in russia just as sanctions in venezuela and cuba and elsewhere have devastated working people and really caused death and poverty to a higher degree but there's also this i think unintended political consequence for the united states in that the more that the united states sanctions the world uses sanctions i think sanctions are on over 
30, I think 39, around 39 countries, US or US backed sanctions. We're sanctioning 39 countries right now. Yeah, I think it's nearly, yeah, it's a large portion. Uh, it's a large <laughs> portion of the world, especially since one of those countries, China, is like a sixth, seventh of the world. So there are some form of sanctions on 39 countries, and all of them to the, in the vast majority, the vast majority of them are against countries that the U.S. sees as adversaries and wants to starve into submission, whether it's through regime change or this containment policy, which I think the United States, or at least a good portion of its elite, wants to see turn into a regime change policy. I'd love to see Vladimir Putin in the Communist Party of China out of power, right? That, but it's just not really in the cards. The point mm -hmm. is, though, is that the more that the United States isolates countries like this, the more that the United States isolates themselves because unlike China and Russia, the United States is actually on a different trajectory, right? Russia had an incredibly painful experience with the fall of the Soviet Union. The breakup of the Soviet Union was an utter disaster. It caused the life expectancy for men over the course of, I think, nine years to decrease by more than 10 years, right? I mean, we're talking about a massive shock. It's shock and awe therapy. They call it shock therapy. Massive shock therapy economic policy, which devastated uh, the Russian economy and the Russian people. But since 2001, things have changed a bit. Things have become more stable. There has been more economic growth. And there has been a shift in relations. That's partly to do with the fact that the United States has become more hostile to Russia and China. But really, when you look at it, it only makes sense that Russia and China would be closer. Not only do they share a border, but they also share a common history. They share a lot of things economically, culturally. Uh, if you just look at, for example, Central Asia, Xinjiang, and Russia, I mean, there are deep cultural bonds. So it only makes sense that those countries become closer. But the U.S. has accelerated this process because it's now viewing both of these countries as enemies. And so financially, the impact, of course, on these countries, the sanctions is significant, right? Even the sanctions on China, despite its intense growth, it causes problems. It creates economic hardship, for example, on people of Xinjiang when Joe Biden sanctions the solar industry, which he did in Xinjiang and still does, uh, or when he sanctions Huawei. And that's one of the biggest tech corporations in China that creates economic problems, despite China's ability to maneuver around them. But these problems then also open up opportunities, which I think are kind, of, are kind of lost on a lot of those who follow these developments where we are in the United States. The opportunities that have arisen are that there is a multipolar world developing and financially that is speaking in a big way. Russia has an economic, a global economic outlook, a plan, the Eurasian Union. Econ the Eurasian, Eurasian Economic Union, which is in, you know, it's in process, it's happening, right? Building stronger ties among uh, Central Asian countries, among Eastern European countries, among the entire Eurasian region, China included, to build networks that are in alternatives and infrastructure projects that can avoid the impact of sanctions. And this has a currency element to it, obviously. The same goes for China with the Belt and Road Initiative, right? These these initiatives, these aims to create further connectivity economically, politically, culturally, financially, specifically, really drive the United States absolutely bonkers because you hit it right on the nail when you said that the U.S. is basically a loan shark with the military behind it. That's been the U.S.'s role since World War II when it became, when it, made the the dollar the reserve currency and it took hold of these major international financial institutions the Bretton Woods institutions and wielded them to uh, assert dominance over Europe and the rest of the world right it took over european europe's colonies and at least administratively it became a neo colonial power after the european powers were devastated by the war and they became reliant upon the United States and their junior partner status remains to this day. Look at the way that the United Kingdom and France, they just grovel at the feet of the United States whenever 
the United States has an actual object. Sometimes they'll disagree on small things, but when there is an objective that the United States wants satisfied that speaks to the heart of U.S. interests, those countries follow suit and follow along like lapdogs because that's exactly what they are. And so this has created a world situation where, yeah, countries like Russia and China are looking at alternatives to the U.S. dollar. They are developing. China is developing a digital currency. When I was there in 2019, 2020, it, it was actually kind of, it was just, it was strange because people would laugh at you if you were like, here, take a, take some of this RMB. They were just like, why don't you pay through the digital, you know, digitally? And then why don't you, and then why don't you check out our digital currency through WeChat or these other apps? And I, I was just like, I don't know how to do any of that, <laughs> you know, and it was just, but this is the, this is the thinking, you know, there's a, there's a huge movement for sovereignty in the world that's led by Russia and China, but it's also led by a lot of the smaller countries that see themselves as connected by common positive aims for self-determination and peace and sovereign economic development, and also for defensive aims of well, we need to make sure the United States isn't destabilizing us. Russia and China at this time are saying we're both opposed to NATO aggression and we're coordinating on preventing color revolutions from achieving or even getting off the, achieving their ends or even getting off the ground. I mean, this shows just such a heightened awareness of the U.S.'s role in all of this. And it necessitates financial independence, right? And, and this is why the United States constantly targets Russian energy. This is what a lot of this is about. It doesn't want 40% of Europe's energy to come from Russia, which is currently what's happening. It doesn't want China's uh, financial institutions and the vast majority of its commanding heights of its economy to be directed by the state. It's the vast majority of them are state-owned, government-controlled. So the United, so China can say, okay, we're going to build a thousand more. Mm -hmm. uh, kilometers of high-speed rail in X region because the government can make that decision and they don't have to listen to, is this going to make money for some rich investor? Is this going to make money for profiteers? And that's what the United States is really afraid of. It's afraid of that these two countries, because of their size, because of their influence, because of their potential, that they will move the world away from U.S. economic dominance and eventually the U.S. dollar specifically. Yeah, and the the, rea the the curious reaction that we'll all see is like how the U.S. is going to respond to it slowly losing its economic prowess. I mean, its economic dominance, I should say, really, and economic control as it slowly starts to lose its economic control. Like you say, China created the digital yuan. Now they've tried to crack down on Bitcoin because they really want to force people into their digital, but even, I'm sorry, if you're going digital, I mean, you know, and everyone in China has a VPN. I've been there, you've been there and, you know, they're all, they're all probably trading it, converting it to Bitcoin, you know, whatever, like they've all, I'm sure they're all doing that. Final question is I know, I, I know you got to run and I, I, I appreciate you taking this time, uh, to come on the show. It's been just really been a great conversation to have with you. Um, I mean, how do you see this playing out in the Ukraine in the next you know, in the next couple of days and weeks, because obviously China and Russia are, are you know, China has already said like, we, you know, we're, we're okay. We're, we support Russia. Um, we say we've got the whole global community and you're talking about maybe 20, like that, you know, Asia's not with us. Like Africa's not with us. Like we, <laughs> Middle East isn't with us. Like we, we, it's just typical, like the whole global community. It's like everyone recognizes Juan Guaido. No, they don't. It's like um, the U S and two countries usually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, you know, you've got NATO that has to come along. So how do you see, I mean, like, I mean, we, are we going to get, are we literally going to get into a ground war in, in the Ukraine with American soldiers? I mean, are we really going to send American soldiers into, I mean, have NATO troops roll into the Ukraine and get into a ground war? I mean, is that going to happen? I don't have a crystal ball. So I can't necessarily predict, but I will say that one thing I'm fairly certain of is that if the United States led that kind of charge, that this slow rolling collapse of the American empire would 
occur very rapidly. The Rand Corporation, much of the U.S.'s military brass from the you know, lowly researchers all the way up to the top, they know they cannot fight a ground war with Russia, with China. Interestingly enough, I watched the Battle of Lake Changjin recently, which was a Chinese film about you, the uh, aid to Korea during the Korean War that China provided against the United States, pushed back the United States at the Yalu River, lost ten, hundreds of thousands of people, but successfully pushed the U.S. back to the point where it was a turning point. The United States was now on the defensive uh, and its aims to destroy Korea and then hopefully lead into China were completely shattered. And as I was watching this film, I was thinking, this is a this is a very strong message. It's a very strong message of unity that China is ready. If there is a war, that it will not be a winnable one. And China's foreign ministry says this all the time, that there's no interest in a war, but we're not going to back down if that's what the United States is going to pursue, especially with regards to Taiwan, which is really the hottest flashpoint. But really, the entire Asia Pacific is being militarized with this potential scenario in mind, a, a completely and utterly ridiculous and counterproductive one. But it's on the table. It's not off the table. There, this, this wouldn't be happening if it were off the table in such a rapid manner. And the same goes for Russia, right? I mean, these are two countries that despite whatever divisions they have on other issues internally, there is one issue that unites nearly the entire populations of both. And that is that these countries will not go back to the era of time, whether it's China's century humiliation from mid 1840s to 1949, or whether it's post-Soviet Russia, right? From the, that devastating decade long period, there's a pretty big consensus that there's no appetite for that. There's no appetite to going back to that. And people will fight to the death to make sure that doesn't happen. So it would be an utterly stupid move on the part of the United States because it would bring all these contradictions to the point of utter collapse. The United States economy couldn't handle it. Oh, God. Its military and wouldn't be able to handle it. Everything would fall apart. And the society, who knows what would happen? I can't predict what would happen. But no. all of these I problems would come to the fore. Yeah, I, you bring a great point. I don't think Americans have the appetite to send several, we would have to send several million young men and women to a ground battle because we would be going up against tens of millions of Russians and Chinese. Does America really want to, do we have 20 million people we want to send over there? I mean, yeah. especially like it would be young people and most millennials and Gen Z's I'm meeting, they're way they're anti-capitalist. They're they're socialist. I mean, they're just like what? Yep. Like they're not. The, the most criticism I get is from like Gen X, my generation, Gen X liberals who are like, Gen "Stop X. criticizing Biden. You're helping Trump," or you know whatever. Like, too many episodes of West Wing are bouncing around in their heads that they can't handle a, a criticism of this. Um, yeah, it's it's really, and I think I think the point that you just made, I think Putin called America's bluff in this because Putin went. And I think the other thing that, that the American media hasn't discussed, and you and I haven't even brought it up yet, but it, it mm -hmm. bears it bears mentioning. It's not it has not been mentioned. Now, this this I talked to, to Susie Dawson, who's in Russia, who's in Moscow, mm -hmm. and she said, Graham, because she's watching other news sources, she says, everyone seems to forget Putin was like me, you know, I I, was, I want, you know, I want NATO, I don't want NATO expansion. I'm, and then the Ukrainian president said, you know, uh, nuclear weapons are, we're going to pursue that possibly. And that's when Putin went, nope. Like mm -hmm. he just said, no, I'm not having nukes on my border. Uh-uh. And no one, of course, talks about it in the American media. Because again, yeah. we went bananas in the 1960s at the idea of nukes in Cuba. I mean, literally, we were on the brink of World War III at right. just the, at, at ships coming. And so Putin was like, absolutely not. He's already got a bunch of nukes pointed at him 800 miles away in Western Europe. So like, I think he called our bluff and, and, yeah. and totally. went, okay, you guys want to get into a ground war world war three, we all die. So we all know that. So you want to get into a ground war? We ain't going anywhere. And the billion and a half Chinese aren't going anywhere. And 
you know, America tried to take over its own capital and all they did was take selfies and steal a podium. So I don't think America's ready. <laughs> no. And, and I want to get, yeah, it's totally true. And let me, I just want to get into the, because the original question was, what do I see happening? Right. And I kind of see, because of the, the far-fetchedness of the scenario we've just been talking about, what I think is going to happen is I, and I think you're very you're correct here. Russia did call the United States' as bluff, and it did so out of necessity, really, because I mean the threats, the provocations, they were just mounting and mounting and mounting, right? Zelensky did a 180 in a matter of days, right? From saying, cool it, cool the jets to the United yep. States, to receiving such intense backlash after that, that he became the puppet that the United States want him to be hoped he would be and what he's been in a lot of ways and now he's saying all in right the weapons nato he's saying up oh, yeah let's do let's let's try to do this i don't even think that's in the cards because the u.s doesn't want to treat ukraine on equal footing with the real european powers right ukraine is not seen as this lily white country it's still seen in this way of like oh yeah you're just the chip you're just the chip in that slavic hell over there you know like that is how the united states sees because the united states is this racist warmongering country it doesn't care about these little no. statelets um but i think what's going to happen is we'll see i think in the best possible scenario the most realistic possible scenario for me is that this bluff will eventually lead to some kind of stalemate right it, politically between all the countries right some kind of cooling of tensions I, I do think a lot of the major problems will persist because the agenda is not going to change from the United States. Ukraine is still going to have what it has. I don't know. I don't think it's going to give up, although Russia wants the U Ukraine to give up all these weapons and all, uh, these military ties with the U.S. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I do see a cooling off period. But I think that this is kind of going to be the strategy for the United States from here on out in Ukraine and honestly, everywhere. I think Given the level of political crisis that the United States is in, there's going to be, need to be periodic flashpoints that are addressed in this kind of bullish manner in a way that grabs this attention, shows the U.S. is still the aggressor, still the number one, still dominant. And it's going to happen not just with regard to Ukraine, but it's going to happen in the Asia Pacific in terms of this larger new Cold War on China. I think it's going to happen everywhere where the United States, States sees opportunities to roll back any alternative to its world in global dominance. So I think that's really where this is going. And every time the United States does this, I think we'll see the consequences of it really bear down on the United States. Because this has actually been a political disaster for Joe Biden himself. I think this could be, honestly, the end of Joe Biden's administration if things persist the way they're going. Well, Polls are showing that people in the United States are not happy with the way this has been addressed, for better or for worse. Maybe there are some who want to see the United States dump its chest harder. And I'm sure there are also many that want to see the United States not do that. So I think there's a divided population, but not an appetite for this kind of fear mongering and kind of dead end politics that the U.S. is employing in this situation. And it seems to only be hurting the current administration. I mean, the 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 when you talk about Americans appetite, I totally agree. And look, if this drags on and a couple months from now, gas is six, seven dollars a gallon. We already inflation is already through the roof and Americans are going to be impact, you know, their, their, their knowledge of geopolitical is going to be like, I don't care. All I know is we're tangled up in this Ukraine bullshit and I can't, you know, it's costing me $90 to fill up my minivan to take my kids to school. So the hell with it. Like the Americans are just going to go, yeah. no, <laughs> right. I mean, which is, uh, yeah, it, which is just, and I hope then that Americans just kind of unify in this, get us out of this. No more of these ridiculous, I'm, we're done. We're just done. Like I yeah. hope Americans wake up to this fact of like the democratically controlled Congress just approved uh, $768 billion for the war budget, including 51 members of the progressive caucus. The democratically controlled Senate said, oh, not 768. Here's an extra 10 billion, $778 billion. 
And Americans, I think, are hopefully waking up to the fact that we're spending way too much money on war. If we cut our military budget in half, we would still outspend China, the next uh, the next country spend in spending. We would still outspend them by $200 billion if we cut our budget in half. And Americans are just like, I think they're finally at least waking up to this, like, what are we, what are we spending all this money on? There's people hungry. And then if a financial crisis hits in the middle of this, which it could, this, 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 I, I watch all these financial experts, man. And they're like, yeah. this is a Ponzi scheme. We keep bailing out the banks. We keep printing money. We've bailed out wall street while the American, you know, the average American just in the last two years is facing evictions and all this other stuff. If that finance was correct, people are going to be like, and like, like you've just been saying, America might, this might be the beginning of the end for America if we really double down on this, um, in this war. So anyway, man, I, 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 I really appreciate you taking your time. Tell everybody who might be new to you, where they can follow you, what your shows are and how they can, uh, to follow the work that you're doing. Sure. So you can catch me a weekly, usually at blackagendareport.com. I write a column. I am writing more on Substack as well. So you can follow me there at chronicles of highfong.substack.com. You can follow me on Twitter at spirit of H O spirit of ho. You can find me on YouTube at the left lens. So just search that and you can find there, subscribe to the channel. And then you can support me at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. Um, yeah, that's, that's where you can support and find all of my work. Danny, thank you so much, man. Appreciate the work you're doing. I'm glad we finally got you on the show and, you know, we'll have you back on again. And if you ever need me to, to come on your show to talk about, yeah. you know, Bitcoin or Epstein or whatever, I can, those are my, those are my two wheelhouses. I can talk about all that as Dude. well. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. I, I really appreciate it, Graham. I've been following you. Thanks. Thanks for all that you're doing. I know that there's been a lot of divisions on certain issues like COVID, but I really appreciate you know, your stance for peace, your, your, your concern for working people, for oppressed people and your consistency. It's, it's really, um, yeah, it's really great. And, and it's really a service to, to the movement. So thank you. Thanks dude. I appreciate that. I, I tell people you might not agree with me, but I believe what I'm saying and no one's paying me to say it. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is the way it, this way it goes down. <laughs> All right, my friend, thank you so much. And, uh, uh we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care. All right. Later, Danny. Bye. Danny Haifong, everybody. That was a, that was amazing. Uh, we're going to put his information up on the screen here. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, that was the, that was the kind of, that was the kind of conversations I like having on the show. So, Hey everybody, thanks for watching. We are still in our like ninth month of demonetization from YouTube. So support what we're doing at patreon.com slash Graham Elwood or rockfin.com slash Graham Elwood, which is a blockchain cryptocurrency platform. It's free to sign up and there's a premium level at $10 a month. And for that, you get everybody on the platform's premium content. Myself, Lee Camp, Ron Placone, Jimmy Dore, Whitney Webb, Kim Iverson, Abby Martin, and many, many others. You can also support what we're doing at Venmo at Graham Elwood and go to GrahamElwood.com. We have a PayPal button and a PO box. I also have crypto wallets, which are all in the show notes. Thanks for supporting what we do.